Greetings, Bill Mobley for On Our Mind, a presentation of UCTV here at UCSD. Um, our sessions on Alzheimer's disease have taught us that early diagnosis is a very important objective of uh, making a difference in people's lives, that uh, later diagnoses may well be uh, confounded by a difficulty in reversing pathology or preventing it. And in that context, genetically predisposed populations are very important for understanding Alzheimer's disease and learning how to treat it. And one such population is the Down syndrome population. With me again is Mike Raffi, who is the head of the adult Down syndrome clinic at uh, UCSD in the Department of Neurosciences. Mike, welcome again. Tell us about your work in this very interesting clinic. Thanks, Bill. The Down Syndrome Clinic is really an extension of the Down Syndrome Research and Treatment Center. And essentially, it allows us to provide care to individuals with Down Syndrome who may be experiencing early onset Alzheimer's disease. Uh, as you mentioned, about 2% of all Alzheimer's cases are uh, familial and early onset. The remaining cases are occurring in patients over the age of 72 and have a usual progression. But in younger individuals, there is a more aggressive uh, uh, process that takes place and a more rapid deterioration. A lot of individuals with Down syndrome are highly at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease by virtue of the fact that the gene for amyloid precursor protein uh, is on the 21st chromosome. And all individuals with Down syndrome have an extra copy of the 21st chromosome and therefore an extra copy of this gene, leading to an overproduction of this protein. Typically, patients by the age of 12 or 13 years old start to have plaques, amyloid plaques in their brain, so that by the age of 40, 100% of individuals with Down syndrome harbor the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease. The changes that occur in the brain once those plaques and tangles build up include deficits in chemicals in the brain, neurotransmitters, but also shrinkage or atrophy of the same areas of the brain that are observed in the genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease as well as sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So genetically defined Alzheimer's disease is due to a gene or uh, in some group of genes that in families or in individuals with Down syndrome basically make the disease happen earlier and perhaps more aggressively. That's correct. But in fact, if you look at those tissue sections, if you're a neuropathologist, it looks like they look the same. In other words, the Alzheimer's disease that you see in these genetically predisposed populations mimics and very much resembles what happens in those of us who don't have a family history. That's exactly right. In fact, researchers here at UCSD, Drs. Glenner and Wong, looked at Alzheimer's brains in the population when it was called senile dementia, and they noted that it looked identical to Down syndrome tissue, and they, they published cases where they had them side by side, and it was impossible to tell the difference. So the pathology is the same. It appears that in the genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease, there's an overproduction of beta amyloid, whereas in the sporadic form of the disease, which happens in the general population at an older age, there's an, there's an impaired clearance of beta amyloid out of the brain. Mike, what can we learn from people with Down syndrome about Alzheimer's disease? There's a lot to learn about Down syndrome as well as its relationship with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we have many research studies ongoing right now to better understand the prevalence as well as the progression of Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome. What's very interesting is that although all people with Down syndrome by the age of 40 can have the plaques and tangles, not all of them show the signs of dementia. And this is similar to in the general population where a third of people over the age of 65 that have no impairment whatsoever have the amyloid plaques and tangles as well. So why is there this dichotomy between having the pathological changes but not the symptoms? And we're very interested in understanding why is that? And is there some factor, whether it's environmental, genetic, or other, that is affecting the person's resilience and allows them to have cognitive uh, abilities despite the presence of the plaques? 
how do you study Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome? How do you develop the knowledge base that allows you to make uh, good guesses about uh, pathogenesis? One of the reasons that it's so exciting to be in the field of Alzheimer's disease today is that we're able to identify markers of the disease before patients really show symptoms. And we can correlate the accumulation of those various biomarkers and the changes in those biomarkers with clinical uh, changes in patients. Uh, for example, we have a number of markers that allow us to visualize changes in the brain that occur in Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome. These include measurements of brain size and regional areas within the brain and how they change with aging. We look at amyloid deposition in the brain, amyloid deposition in the retina, amyloid levels in the blood, uh, and it's not just amyloid. We also look at tau deposition in the brain, as well as some other functional measures and cognitive measures in people with Down syndrome that we believe are at high risk for developing Alzheimer's dementia down the road. Mike, you've been the author of a, uh, of a pilot study that aims to provide us with a natural history of these changes in people with Down syndrome. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. It's been known for decades that people with Down syndrome develop Alzheimer's disease pathology. What hasn't been known is what is the rate of progression of those changes and is it happening before the patients develop symptoms? Uh, so we now have these non-invasive techniques uh, that allow us to measure biomarkers. So the study that you're referring to is called the Down Syndrome Biomarker Initiative. And this pilot study really looked at uh, and looks at how patients with Down syndrome or individuals with Down syndrome uh, can participate in a research study such as this. Are they capable? And, and what we have found so far is they are absolutely capable. And they are eager to participate and they are uh, uh, individuals that give full effort when they're participating in research. And what we find is that the biomarker changes in people with Down syndrome are identical to the changes we see on the same biomarkers in people with genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease. So that's very exciting because it allows us to perhaps march even earlier in the course of the disease, uh, of Alzheimer's disease, and find out when is the pathology really starting because we believe that may be the best time to intervene to maximize efficacy or benefit from any intervention. Uh, are there plans to expand the study to include more people going forward? The DISBY pilot is a feasibility study for a much larger study. And in fact, last year we had a steering committee meeting with various members and organizations who are interested in this type of research. Our hope is to conduct a study with 200 individuals across multiple sites around the country to bring out uh, this type of biomarker testing and understand the natural history of Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome so that potentially we can bring other developments in the field of Alzheimer's disease into this population as well. And I would think that uh, if one really knows that there's an evolution of this disorder in people with Down syndrome, what we learn in Down syndrome might well inform the markers we look for, the things we measure in people with uh, uh, with Alzheimer's disease due to other causes. Absolutely. I think that uh, the genetic populations, including Down syndrome, give us the opportunity to understand the earliest stages of where Alzheimer's disease may be starting and allow us to look at new non-invasive measures of Alzheimer's disease pathology. What's unique about the Down syndrome population is they represent the world's largest predetermined Alzheimer's disease population. And given the baseline intellectual disability, I believe they are the most vulnerable population to dementia. Therefore, it makes the most sense to bring our latest advances in the world of Alzheimer's disease to this population that is, number one, genetically predetermined, and number two, more vulnerable. So there's a dream uh, that one day, hopefully soon, we'll know enough about Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome that we might actually prevent Alzheimer's disease in everybody. Absolutely, and secondary prevention means that you understand there's a po positive biomarker in an individual before they develop any symptoms. And we would love to bring the latest therapies that are being looked at in the general population, as well as the other genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease into the Down syndrome population, and perhaps glean better understanding of when is the right time to intervene to have secondary prevention in Alzheimer's disease. Exciting. Uh, what trials are you uh, involved in right now at UCSD, Mike? 
There are multiple studies that we're conducting at our site. One is a behavioral intervention where we observe uh, participation in a weekly yoga session and how it impacts agitation, anxiety, depression, and we have a placebo group and we've been conducting it for over a year. So behavioral intervention, non-pharmacological interventions are very valid and should be studied rigorously. So we have a clinical trial for that. In addition, we're looking at a compound called siloinositol. This is a sugar derived from palm trees that's known to bind beta amyloid. And it's been tested in patients with Alzheimer's disease and we've just concluded an early stage study of siloinositol in people with Down syndrome. Again, we have found that participants are able to go through all of the testing measures successfully without any issues. We're also conducting a uh, clinical trial looking at uh, cognitive enhancement using a molecule that affects the GABAergic system in the brain to see if we can promote improved cognition, attention, and memory function. And this is based on a long series of preclinical studies that's now been brought into the clinic for testing. All exciting stuff. Is there anything on the horizon that you'd like to talk about? Well, we've just been awarded an NIH grant to conduct an anti-amyloid study in individuals with Down syndrome. And I think this is really leveraging all of the interest in Alzheimer's disease and in that field in terms of secondary prevention and bringing it into a population that I think would inform us, the Alzheimer's world, about when is the best time to intervene and uh, also bring the latest technology and treatment into this population. That's great. What would you advise a family with a loved one with Down syndrome who's an adult uh, with respect to what they might do to become more involved in this process? I think that it's very important to keep in mind that clinicians are there to provide assessments of how a patient is doing in a snapshot of time. What's most helpful is to have the individual followed over time so that we know if the changes are um, behavioral, psychological, or truly a neurodegenerative disease. I would encourage all family members to have uh, the individual with Down syndrome evaluated by their clinician to obtain baseline testing so that if there is a change, they would, they would be able to act accordingly. Certainly participating in research is another way to get access to uh, more assessments of that individual. And, and I think we can encourage all families uh, of people with Down syndrome to be aware of what's going on in the world, the new research that's happening, and, and to make themselves available for research activities that uh, help them, but also help others with Down syndrome. Mike, thanks for being with me. For Bill Mobley and uh, the Honor Mind series, uh, thanks for being with us.